Thank you everyone for coming to the session this afternoon and we're going to start up. I'd like to introduce my co-chair, uh, Professor Elif Dagley, and I'm Angela Jackson-Morris. I'm from the Tobacco Control Department of the Union and I'm delighted to be involved with this session this afternoon. We've got a great lineup of speakers focusing on packaging and labelling and there's some interesting new research and probably some good controversial matters for discussion at the end. Uh, we'll keep the questions for the end, so if you have any hot burning questions, please jot them down. And I'm delighted to welcome our first speaker, Ms. Renu Sharma, who works for the Union Un uh, Southeast Asia office. And please give her a warm welcome, because I believe this is her first presentation. Oh. Uh, today I'm a gone uh, actually today uh, I want to talk about a tobacco pack warning in Southeast Asia uh, where we after a long 12 years of FCTC uh, so I would like to give you a, I would like to give you a little bit of, uh, a background uh, that tobacco use is a major public health challenge in Southeast Asia region it is responsible for 1.2 million deaths in the region out of the total global mortality, 5.4 million annually. FCTC, uh, FCTC Article 11 says that each country should enact effective measures to ensure appropriate health warning on tobacco products. Uh, now we have gathered some information uh, and I have the data that, uh, uh, that will uh, conclude that uh, 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 actually, it would have a date of ratification, enactment of pack warning legislation and rules, uh, 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 history, of, uh, history of implementation, tobacco product, uh, uh, tobacco product, uh, uh, sorry, covered, and history of uh, history of uh, any litigation. And this information has been has been gathered by the union staff, partners, internet, WHO documents and empower reports and peer review journals. Um, uh, this slide says uh, the status of Southeast Asia region who have signed the FCTC and when they have signed the ratification. Uh, so we have some analysis here that Bangladesh was the first country in the region to sign FCTC and India was the first country to ratify FCTC, that is in February 2004. And Nepal was the last country in the region to ratify FCTC in November 2006. Uh, now all countries in the region has, has ratified FCTC except Indonesia. Uh, now what Article 11 FCTC says that each party shall, within a period of three years, after entry into force of this convention for that party adopt and implement in accordance with its, uh, with its national law effective measures to ensure that all tobacco products should carry a pictorial warning. And this slide says what is the status of a graphic health warning. Uh, So we have done some analysis here uh, that Thailand is the only country in the region which enacted pack warning legislation within a specified three years of ratifying. Three out of 11 countries in the region don't have graphic health warning. Uh, that is DP, uh, that is the DPRK and Maldives Timor Leste. Uh, 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 six, out of, uh, six out of 11 countries have a pack warning complying with WHO CTC and Empower. Five out of 11 countries mandate rotation of pack warning, which extend from three months in Bangladesh and two years in Indonesia. Um, and Bhutan is a non-producing country, uh, but the imported product should have a pectoral warning. Uh, here Nepal leads in the region with 90% graphic health warning and Indonesia with 40% only. Pack warning legislation of 
Of only three countries covered all type of tobacco, all type of tobacco uh, product. Uh, 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 that is India, Myanmar, and Thailand. And the number of graphic health warning images notified for printing varies from four in India and ten in Myanmar. Six out of the seven countries faced stiff resistance from tobacco industry and had litigation delaying FCTC compliant pack warning from 2 to 11 years. So it is an estimated that 1.80 billion people out of the 1.86 billion people uh, are being informed about the harm of tobacco use in Southeast Asia region. Now I would like to share with you a case study of uh, of our country, India. Uh, why I have chosen this because it is a classic example of tobacco industry interference. A government of India has uh, has 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 enacted the uh, has enacted the law uh, that we call cigarette and uh, and other tobacco product act. In short, we call it as a uh, in short, we call it as a, uh, as a cutpa. And the section seven of the act says that it is uh, 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 it says that it is mandatory to have a pictorial warning on all tobacco product act. And the rule uh, uh, and the rule to enforce section seven were notified in July two thousand six only. So here is the flowchart which uh, which says about the journey of first pack warning implemented of India. Uh, although the rule has been implemented, uh, uh, like uh, uh, we have introduced our law in 2003, and pack warning was uh, and pack warning was uh, was uh, and pack warning was uh, uh, was mandated. Uh, but the rule uh, were not there. So rule has been implemented in 2006. Uh, but uh, it also took, uh, uh, but it uh, also took the long three years uh, due to uh, many social, political blockades and tobacco industry, BD industry, who has put the, the who has put the litigation in various high court across the India. And after that, Supreme Court has to intervene and he has to pass the order for implementation. And then finally, first spec warning was implemented in 2009. So this was the, actually this is the pictorial warning which has been notified in 2006, but it was never implemented. Uh, this was notified in 2007, and it was also never implemented. So finally, this was the pictorial warning which has been introduced in 2009, but it was so weak. Uh, uh, it was so so weak because uh, because the group of minister, which was an empowered group of uh, constitution by prime minister, has deleted the pack warning from 50% on both sides to 40% on front panel only. Um, and they choose milder. And uh, uh, they choose milder and ineffective and untested pack warning. Wholesale and semi whole packages was exempted from depicted pack warning, and it is remained effective uh, till 2011. Now this pack warning was notified in 2010 for the uh, for the rotation purpose, but it was uh, never implemented. Uh, this. Uh, actually, this pack warning was implemented in 2011, and it was remained till 2013. But it was only the 40% only one side. This pack warning was implemented in 2013 till uh, till 2016, and it was uh, uh, and it was also a 40% one side. Now we have a current pack warning which was introduced in April 2016 
and, and it is 85% both sides. Uh, so now you have seen that it was a long journey uh, for the 85% implementation of pack warning. So what the tobacco industry tactics to derail the, uh, 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 the pack warning in India? It was an unforgettable and eventful history of tobacco industry in India journey to effective pack warning on tobacco product. Pack warning was only uh, pack warning was only policy among empower which was diluted and deferred for implementation almost six to seven times in last 10 years. Uh, they have used front group like farmers, beauty workers, and traders to influence policy makers, implementers, media, and general public. Uh, they have used industry sponsored studies to influence policy makers that large pack warning are ineffective and cumbersome to implement. They also use false propaganda due to which, uh, the, like due to which illicit trade has increased, farmer are committing suicide and loss of livelihood. They also blame foreign funding organization for hatching a conspiracy to weaken Indian farmer and their livelihood. So it is the advertisement from All India Beauty Industry Federation uh, that they need to see uh, justice. Now, what was the response of tobacco control expert in, and activist? So it was a cohesive response, multi-stakeholder engagement, a whole of the social response. And uh, moreover, it was, uh, 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 moreover, the activists were ahead of tobacco industry and, uh, and its front group in final phase of the battle. So they fought, they fought on all fronts. Uh, that is one-to-one -one advocacy, high-level media advocacy, and they count on notes. They use evidence and the scientific writing, uh, multi-stakeholder engagement, a letter by international expert and leaders written to prime minister, finance minister, and health minister of, of India, mobilized support of. of uh, of medical, dental, and doctor association, women and child development group, and youth group. Uh, they use voice of victim, uh, highest level of fight in the courtroom, and they kept reminding Minister of Health, Prime Minister, and other politicians of ruling parties of the responsibilities. So the uh, so. Uh, it is a request from civil societies uh, to uh, to our prime minister for a new pictorial warning and these are the advertisement from uh, voice of victim's wife uh, uh, and they need 85% warning and finally the battle was won with 85% with graphic health warning on all tobacco product to be rotated every 12 months. Thanks. Thank you, Renu. And um, I'm delighted to pass over as okay. we move on to our next speaker. Thank you. Uh, so we, the next paper is from Vietnam. Changes in Vietnamese male smokers' reactions. Nagan and Beach. Yeah, and we'll keep any questions for the end of the presentations, if that's okay. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Ngan Chan. Uh, I'm from the researcher from Hanoi University of Public Health. Uh, today, what I'm talking uh, about will be my research in the trend in Vietnamese male smoker reaction towards the new pictorial cigarette back warnings uh, that is conducted along with the Vietnam Public Health Association. So in Vietnam, from 1996, we started to print the picture, uh, to print the health warning on cigarette package, but the warning remains uh, text only for the next 16 years until 2013, uh, when our first ever pictorial health warnings uh, contains both the pictures and the text message uh, were implemented in the May 2013. 
uh, as you can see in this graph from the uh, Australian research that uh, respond to the new warning will reach the peak level shortly after the implementation, and then it's decreased afterwards. Uh, the extent of the wear out is different from country to country, and it depends on the specific pictorial health warnings that implemented. Uh, that's why at that point of time, because the first ever set of the pictorial health warnings just implemented in Vietnam, we want to we wanted to accept the chain of chains in the salient of uh, the pictorial health warnings and also the chain of chains in reaction of smoker towards uh, the new pictorial health warnings in our country. We conducted a repeated cross-sectional study uh, with two rounds. The first round was in May 2014, which is one year after the implementation of the warnings, and just but only two months after the deadline for tobacco manufacturers to print the pictorial health warnings. The second way uh, was in May 2015, which is one year after the first way. The target respondents were male smokers aged uh, 18 to 35, were recruited from six provinces in Vietnam, representative for the north, the central, and the south. The sample size of the study in each row was around 1,500. In terms of the results, the salient of the pictorial health warnings uh, increased from the first way to the second way. Uh, for example, the proportion of smokers who noticed the cigarette package, uh, the pictorial health warning on cigarette package, increased from 16% in the first way to 25% in the second way of the research. So the key point is uh, two years after the implementation or 14 months after the deadline for manufacturers to print the pictorial health warnings, the salient of the new pictorial health warning in Vietnam has not yet decreased, but the avoidance toward the pictorial health warnings already did is decreased from uh, so when the prison of the pictorial health warning on the back of a uh, smoker, regular smoke brand increased from 78% to 87% uh, from the first way to the second way of the research, the proportion of smoker who tried to avoid the uh, pictorial health warnings uh, decreased from 35% to 23%. So it seemed that uh, after the smoker got used to seeing this new set of pictorial health warnings in Vietnam uh, on their cigarette packets, they did not try to avoid the, pack, the, the warnings anymore. Uh, we also uh, had given the assumption scenario where at the street vendor or store, the customer prefer brand uh, have both types of the uh, package, that the, the package that have pictorial hair warning and then do not have the pictorial hair warnings. We asked for the selection of the smoker. Uh, in the first wave of the research, 42% of smokers still choose to buy the non-pictorial hair warning pack, even when that pack has higher price. In the second way, only 35% of the smoker would do so. Uh, another scenario that we gave is that in the at the store, because the customer prefer brand only have the bag without the pic, with the pictorial health warnings. Um, in the first way, 27 of the smoker really want to buy the bag that have without the without the pictorial health warning so much as they win by another brand instead of their regular plan. As long as the an, another brand has the back without uh, pictorial health warnings. In the second way, only 17% of the smoker would do that far to buy the back uh, without the pictorial health warnings. So the time passed by and the smoker uh, in Vietnam became less willingly to buy the non pictorial health warning back if it's not available at the time of buying or if it's more expensive than the back with uh, pictorial health warnings. Well, to wrap up, uh, the warnings in Vietnam is supposed to lose some of the impact with time, uh, sadly, but it's already happened with the current set of pictorial health warnings in Vietnam, uh, two years now. Uh, it's time now to start the rotation cycle to refresh our uh, set of pictorial health warnings. Uh, meanwhile, to maintain the salience, uh, anti-smoking campaign using the image of pictorial health warning is needed. And to enhance the salient, I think the we think that the larger pictorial health warnings or the plain packaging uh, should be considered. Uh, that's all I have to tell to talk to you today, and I think the question will be at the end of the session. So thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Vietnam. That was wonderful. And, and we're now going to move on to overcoming resistance to bigger and better graphic health warnings. And we've got some case studies from Nepal, Cambodia, and Pakistan. And to speak is, first of all, Mr. Fuad Aslam. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Dr. Fawad Aslam, and I'm the technical officer of uh, tobacco control for the union in Pakistan. And this is a presentation on case studies from uh, Nepal, Cambodia, and Pakistan. I've uh, worked on it along with my colleague, Dr. Tara. Um, uh, my colleagues have already covered uh, the introductions before, so I won't go into the detail. But suffice to say that uh, uh, low- and middle-income countries are bearing the brunt of uh, tobacco burden. Uh, around 80% of all the deaths occur in low- and middle-income countries. And graphic health warnings, uh, they form a part of the um, Empower package, and they are one of the most effective strategies, especially in the poor countries, because they, are, um, they don't cost anything to the government. It's very simple to implement them. And uh, they also reach out to a larger audience because the literacy rate is so low in the low- and middle-income middle countries. Uh, that is the reason that they are so aggressively challenged by the tobacco industry at all fronts. Uh, first introduced by Canada in 2001, uh, now we have more than 70, close to 80 countries, I think, that have graphic health warning, and 60-plus countries now have larger warnings, that is more than 50% in size. And recently, countries in the South Asia region, like Nepal, India, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, Myanmar, Bangladesh, uh, they all moved towards enhanced graphic health warnings, meaning they were uh, trying to have warnings covering more than 75% of the size. Uh, in this uh, presentation, we'll look at examples from three countries, Nepal, Cambodia, and Pakistan, and we'll see the difference. Nepal is a resounding success. The, it's a world leader, and uh, no thanks to uh, Nepal. <laughs> and uh, Cambodia has made steady progress, while Pakistan, having a very good start in the beginning, is, has been struggling in the, in the recent past. Um, if, if you look at the slide, uh, I mean, like Reno mentioned, that uh, Nepal signed FCTC in 2003, uh, ratified it in 2006, but they didn't have any effective tobacco control measures up till 2009. Um, in 2009, they introduced a simple text warning, I think, covering only a 10 percent of the of the side. In 2010, the union uh, and the BI program started working with the Ministry of Health for a comprehensive tobacco control law, and one of the components of that law was 75 um, percent uh, graphic health warnings, in addition to other measures. And at this time, the tobacco industry, in order to preempt that law uh, coming into force, they started working themselves with the um, uh, government of Nepal and Ministry of Health. And they, uh, the, the government of Nepal uh, uh, was under the influence of the industry, and they, they promulgated 30% uh, graphic health warnings and notified that. Uh, if, if, if the industry had had this say, uh, this big red line would have been the final point. There would have been no tobacco control progressing beyond that. But uh, all the tobacco control advocates, uh, they persisted uh, for the comprehensive law, so the 30% the warnings were actually never implemented. And uh, crashing through the barrier uh, in 2011, uh, tobacco control law was actually adopted, and it provided for 75% health warnings. As expected, the tobacco industry didn't uh, take this lying down, so they sued the government with not one, not two, but 12 cases. Uh, as we all know, the litigation process is long, expensive, drawn out, so it, it lingered on for three years in Nepal, uh, when in 2014, finally, the government won the cases and the 75% graphic warnings were enforced. Uh, since the industry could not stop it now, so they, they entered into the delaying tactic phase. We don't have the technical expertise and all that kind of stuff. So rather than uh, being implemented immediately in 2014, uh, they were, the warnings were implemented in, I think, March of 2015. Uh, one good provision the law, uh, the Nepalese law has is that the warnings have to be rotated every six months. And after the first law was passed by the parliament of Nepal, the, now the Ministry of Health has the power to change the size uh, of, the, of the warnings as well. So Dr. Tara worked very closely, uh, the union and all the tobacco control advocates worked very closely with the Ministry of Health. Constant pressure was put up that the next round should have enhanced warnings. So uh, the, the law uh, was that the, the law was passed that the new warnings would be 90% in size. Uh, so the new warnings were to come into force in 2015. As expected, once again, the tobacco industry sued the government, but this time they also used uh, some other tactics, you know, exerting diplomatic pressure from all the um, regional countries who had influence over the government of Nepal, and when that didn't work, they roped in the help of the U.S. Chambers of Commerce. Uh, the president of the U.S. Chambers of Commerce visited 
the Prime Minister of, um, I had a meeting with the Prime Minister of Nepal and I think he, he, he conveyed that there might be some financial implications for, for the country of Nepal if they proceeded with 90% warnings. At the same time, the civil society also sued the government of Nepal that you cannot backtrack on, on, on the 90% enhanced warning. So we, have, we now have two sets of uh, litigations going on, one by the tobacco industry, one by the civil society. And in the meantime, Although the cases are still pending in the court, uh, the 90% graphic warnings were passed. Uh, they came into play and they have also been rotated. So the last two pictures you see, both of them are concurrently in place. There are now five uh, sets of warnings and all of them are 90% in size. And uh, although the matters are still pending, but this is great progress by Nepal. And uh, the real success factors was the resolve of the Ministry of Health, the support of civil society, but especially the support of the media. They put constant pressure on the ministry, on the government, as well as uh, you know, putting the judiciary. Uh, they didn't let and this issue die down. So they have been a key element in success. Um, moving on to Cambodia, um, another country in the region um, signed uh, uh, FCTC in 2004. Just like other countries, nothing much happened till 2009. Slapped a single 30% uh, text warning, you know. Tobacco industry was happy, the ministry was complacent, uh, nothing going on. Um, Union Bloomberg Initiative program uh, started working with the Ministry of Health uh, for once again a comprehensive law which uh, in included 55% um, graphic health warnings. And at this time the industry also started to you know, lobby with um, their favorites, you know, the Ministry of Economy and Ministry of Finance. And they utilize their uh, front groups and tobacco growers and retailers and they also utilize a section of the media to oppose that. Um, but uh, the law was passed in October 2015 and uh, the warnings came into force. At this time, once again, the industry started with their delaying tactics. So finally, after a delay of around eight to nine months, um, it was in July 2016 that the 55% warnings effectively were enforced. Uh, the ministry is now working uh, to improve that and the tobacco industry, of course, is now working to dilute it. So that is, it's a constant tussle going on. And once again, the key factors for this success in Cambodia were the resolve of the Ministry of Health and support of the media. So this is an example of, of a good and steady progress, but a lot more needs to be done because 55% is not uh, the ideal warning. Um, moving on to Pakistan. Interestingly, Pakistan actually had a law in 1979 uh, for graphic health warning, so much before FCTC, but uh, it was a simple text warning of, uh, you know, uh, smoking causes, uh, smoking is injurious to health. So in, pa in 2002, Pakistan had a comprehensive tobacco control law which also touched on the graphic warnings but gave the powers to the ministry to promulgate any notification that they may, see, uh, may desire. In 2003, so from 79 till 2003, around uh, 24, 25 years, we had a single simple text warning. It was once again rotated in 2003 to smoking causes uh, cancer. In 2008, uh, Union BI program started working with the Ministry of Health to look at the law in totality and uh, urge towards uh, graphic health warnings. Uh, sensing that the tobacco industry started working with the ministry and the government and, and they lobbied for uh, text-based warnings. So they said that rather than having new graphic warnings, let's have four new text-based warnings and rotate that. So the notification was issued in 2008, but just like in Nepal, it was never implemented. And, uh, you know, the tobacco control advocates, civil society, union, international organizations, they continue to work with the ministry for graphic health warnings. And on World No Tobacco Day 2009, uh, the notification was issued for new graphic health warnings, which were to cover 40% of the front and the back, both. I think India and Pakistan promulgated on the same time on World No Tobacco Day 2009. The difference was that ours was covering the front and the back and was so relatively more uh, hard-hitting compared to the uh, simpler term. So um, I, I'm a witness to the fact that this was concealed by the tobacco industry. The speech was typed at 2 a.m. in the morning, actually, and it wasn't even typed by the Ministry of Health, uh, you know, typist. It was sort of like typed at home. So the industry had no idea what's, what was going on. They were quite happy there's nothing going to happen. So when the announcement came, it was a shock for them. So immediately they went into the overdrive mode and started to lobby, you know, uh, with the industry, with the ministry and all, all the other stakeholders to reverse the decision. Uh, but the, uh, they couldn't get the decision reversed, so they start, once the notification was confirmed, they started with the delaying tactics. Uh, the, originally, the, uh, the warnings were to come into effect on 1st of February 2010, but they were delayed 
till the August of 2010. I'll just hurry along. Uh, the warning was supposed to rotate, to be rotated every year, uh, but they couldn't be rotated because there was a big con fundamental constitutional change in Pakistan where the powers of health were devolved to the provinces. So there was a big legal and constitutional tussle, and the industry exploited that. Uh, finally, in 2015, the Ministry of Health issued a notification order for 85% graphic health warnings covering the front and the back. As expected, the, uh, the industry didn't accept it at all, and they lobbied with everybody, especially the finance minister, and this time they roped in services of the British High Commissioner, who actually had a presentation with BAT members and said that these warnings should not come into place because they, are, you know, they, they, they won't help the economy and trade and stuff. The Minister of Finance uh, caved, against, uh, caved in uh, against the pressure by the British High Commissioner, we, we always get pressurized by the British to do stuff like that, you know. So, <laughs> since ages, we've been, we've been their colonial servants for a long time. So, <laughs> anyway, so um, the Minister of Finance formed a supra committee uh, over and above the Ministry of Health, you know, and that committee decided that we're not going to go with 85% warnings, but with a phased approach of going from 40 to 50, 50 to 60, and then we'll do a survey and then see. The civil society then sued the Ministry of Health and Ministry of Finance uh, in the High Court in July of 2015, and it's been now, I think, close to 18 months, something like that, and the matter is still pending in the court. And uh, till the time the decision comes from the court, no further progress can be made. Uh, the lessons learned quickly are that civil society organizations and international organizations need to predict and assist the governments to prepare for legal challenges that they will eventually face for sure. So we need to preempt that rather than act afterwards. And it's also critical for the Ministry of Health to engage all the stakeholders from the very beginning rather than having a solo flight because that creates a lot of problems. If the civil societies in Pakistan hadn't taken on board earlier, uh, they would have been able to better withstand, help the government withstand the pressure. Media support uh, in examples of Nepal and Cambodia shows that it's been crucial for success. And it's very important that a proper assessment of the political landscape is done and measurement of the extent to which your enemy, the industry, will go. Pakistan didn't do it. They went for 85% warnings when it was uh, apparent that it won't work. So if they had gone for smaller warnings from, let's say, 40 to 65%, 70%, that would have been effective and would have you know, transferred the benefit to the population. So you need to map the political landscape beforehand. Thank you very much. Okay, there has been a change in the seconds of talks, uh, and the next speaker will be from India. Uh, are loose cigarettes associated with increased intensity of smoking? Gol Sharma Kumar Kumar Dogra. Uh, thank you, Chair, uh, <clears throat> for preparing this presentation because there's a parallel session which is going on and which I'll be presenting, so I requested. So thank you for considering the request. And my apologies to uh, the presenters who will be following me for waiting further. Uh, so I'll be presenting uh, the topic, are loose cigarettes associated with increased intensity of smoking? Uh, it's a secondary analysis from a Global Adult Tobacco Survey India 2009-10. And at this point of time, I'd like to acknowledge the union uh, for supporting the workshop because th this is the paper out of a workshop which is conducted, paper writing workshop, which we conducted at the northern part of our country. Uh, and uh, in this union uh, was a partner to it. We all know that uh, the tobacco manufactured in cigarette forms account for 96% of the sale of tobacco products. And there's an increase in sale and consumption of cigarettes has increased over time as compared, when you compare to last decade. And uh, India has a unique distinction of having the largest proportion of smokers. And uh, we know uh, there's a documented evidence that suggests that 50 to 70% of cigarette sales is of loose cigarettes or single stick cigarettes. And there are various reasons for why people purchase loose cigarettes first the easy accessibility of cigarettes and affordable to consumers because uh, many poor if they want to many poor and the students if they want to consume they just buy the single sticks second normally in india we find it socially unacceptable to carry packs in the pockets so uh, they just buy the cigarettes and consume there and then 
then it prevents exposure of smokers to pictorial warning, as in the last presentation we have seen that people don't want to see pictorial warnings. So they just buy the cigarettes, lose cigarettes, and lose cigarettes associated with increased price per unit. And normally that is pocketed by the vendor and there's a loss of revenue to the governments. So there is a debate in recent times which is happening about the public health concerns about the sale and purchase of cigarettes. And uh, there is no much evidence, documented evidence, whether the loose cigarette is associated with increased intensity of smoking. So we thought to assess the prevalence of behavior of purchasing loose cigarettes among uh, cigarette smokers in India and determine if buying loose cigarette is associated with increased intensity with smoking. So as I've already told, uh, it's a secondary data analysis of uh, GATS, India 2009-10, conducted in May 2014. Uh, it's a household survey of uh, uh, non institutionalized adults, population aged 15 and above. And um, the key outcome variables which we have taken is intensity of smoking, defined as average number of cigarette smokes per day. So this was uh, uh, the outcome variables and exposure variables were behavior of purchasing loose cigarettes. So we have taken some questions from the data set and we have, these are the two main variables. Other exposure variables were age, gender, residence, uh, occupation, and wealth index. So wealth index is, uh, was uh, calculated by the position of assets using standard-based approach and we used the principal component analysis to find the wealth of individual. And uh, this uh, study was exempted uh, from ethics review by chairperson of uh, ethics advisory group of international union. And we used Epidata software to analyze and straight up version two. Uh, out of uh, around 70,000 odd individuals which were taken in GATS in India, around 11,500 smoked any type of tobacco product. And out of that, around nine, Thousand, that is 80% smoke cigarette. And prevalence of buying loose cigarettes among cigarette smokers were almost 56.8%. So uh, around uh, every second individual is buying the loose cigarettes. The prevalence of buying loose cigarettes was common among males, but uh, decreasing with level, decreased with increased level of education and wealth index. So as the education level increases, the buying of loose cigarettes decrease, as it is evident from other similar studies. So this shows that uh, proportion was higher, loose cigarette bought was higher among males. And if you see, the non-formal schooling and less than primary schooling, uh, people buy more loose cigarettes as compared to the other uh, educational group. But it was almost, almost similar in rural and urban community. When we see the occupation, those people who are retired or those are unemployed or those who are non-government employed buy more loose cigarettes as compared to the government employees. Uh, the wealth index quantile also suggests that the poorest to the poor people buy more loose cigarettes as compared to uh, the other people. So it was also seen that the majority of respondent, almost 85% people, who bought loose cigarette tend to buy less than 10 cigarettes a day. So this was a little bit surprising uh, when we uh, just analyzed the data and over two thirds of the cigarette smokers who smoked less than five cigarettes per day bought loose cigarettes. So whereas cigarette smokers with smoking intensity more than 15 per day bought more loose cigarettes. Non-loose cigarettes, yeah, but more non-loose cigarettes. So this was an, another surprising fact, which we have not found in the studies. So this was an uh, interesting finding. Um, and the average number of loose cigarettes smoked per day, you can see those people who are buying less than five or five to nine cigarettes are buying more loose cigarettes. But if they are buying more, if they are smoking more cigarettes, buying uh, more non-loose cigarettes, that is packed cigarettes. So uh, the intensity of smoking was 70% less among loose cigarette buyers than non-buyers. So this was, a con this was something uh, which actually surprised us uh, when we analyzed the data set. And loose cigarette buying behavior was in fact protective in unemployed those as compared to those unable to work and those age group 65 plus and rural population. 
So this was the unadjusted and adjusted odd ratio, which shows that uh, the loose cigarette was more in uh, this uh, 65 and above and rural population. And this was, I have already discussed about the non-government employee. So I conclude that nearly 60% of adult smokers in India purchased loose cigarettes. So applying this to an estimated 6.1 million smokers in India, it translates to almost 3.46 million people who are buying loose cigarettes in India. So it was a huge number. And in fact, it's a huge loss to the GDP and huge loss to the government uh, money. And the behavior of buying loose cigarette was associated with reduced intensity of smoking. So it provides a useful baseline against uh, which future trends can be assessed. And, but we need to take this finding with a pinch of salt because uh, this is an unusual finding. I could not review from the literature any other finding which was there, but yes, it was from existing data set which we used. So uh, some of the limitation of the study was uh, data was missing from nearly two third of the smokers in the survey. We have, uh, this is uh, the data limitation of the GATS and we, uh, I and Pranay have actually analyzed uh, the data like GATS, this thing, and we have written some policy paper on that there are something wrong in the previous GATS, which, is, which needs to be done. So, but given the retrospective nature of the study, we could not do anything just to analyze that. But another, being a cross-sectional study, it is difficult to assume that tendency to smoke fewer cigarettes among those buying loose cigarettes will be sustained and converts to a greater quit rate. So again, and the second thing is no exact information of the exact reasons of why people buy loose cigarettes is known by the study. So, but we need to have uh, more prospective studies actually to confirm these findings. Then given the quantum of loose cigarette smokers, it's necessarily ensured that there should be a warning. I think we are advo advocating this. And uh, um, in fact, in many states of our country have actually banned loose cigarettes in our country. And uh, we need to have new tax policies with, which cover sale of single cigarettes because it's a huge loss to the government and uh, need to periodically monitor the sale, of, sale and purchase of loose cigarettes to assess the trends because it's an important public health issue. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for this very unexpected results. And we proceed with the next study. Okay, so we're moving on now to are health warnings really effective? And I'd like to invite Dr. Tara Singh Bam to present. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks for, I, I can really understand that why, you know, my presentation was escaped because the Pakistan and then must be the India then. So how come the, the, the Nepal can come in between? I can understand. Thank you very, very much anyway. So this topic is very, I think it's, a, it's quite huge. I will try my best to prove that pictorial health warnings are effective. Let's see uh, the, uh, the uh, I don't know this, or can I use this? Oh, okay, thanks. So the one of the key objectives of the pictorial health warnings is to promote public awareness on danger of tobacco use. And the second objective is to denormalize the tobacco in our community. And there are two groups. One group, we, we promote public health. And the another group is that promote tobacco, that is tobacco industry. So the mic, well, now the, I'm going to present the whether the Victoria Health Warning has any impact or any effect to the, our community in the public health side, and also any effect to tobacco industry behavior. So if we, uh, yes, if both are yes, and then very clear, we have to sustain pictorial health warning, improve pictorial health warning. If, if it's also, if we, if pictorial health warning is affecting to the industry, of course, our intervention should be to prevent and stop now. So, this is the question. The, the study that we have done is not a very scientific. We come from village and we work with the villagers. The village boy has worked with the many villagers in many countries. And the countries, as Renu has mentioned, hasn't signed the FCTC, that is Indonesia, and implemented a pictorial health warning in 2014. And also Renu, in the first speaker, she said, 
Nepal, among the, the, the signatories, Nepal was one of the last countries that signed the FCTC in Southeast Asia. So it's a two different things. But the, I would like to clarify that the, in a Renu presentation, the Nepal's pictorial health warning law is very comprehensive, and that applies to all types of tobacco products. It's not only, I think I saw the only BD at cigarette, no. All types of tobacco product, both chewing, cigarette, BD, all. So please correct your, uh, the slide and information as well. So what happened, the, if you look at the, this slide, whether pictorial health warnings build any awareness on tobacco use. In Indonesia, if you look at, yes, 83% of the people, it's a, it's a huge study, more than 5,000 people, the respondents got involved in this study. So the results is, yes, more than 80%, they said, yes, it's effective to promote the harm. Even among the current smoker, more than 70% of them said, yes, pictorial health warnings are effective. In Nepal, yes, more than 90% of the respondents, the total respondents were at, uh, more than 2,000. So they said, yes, they are effective. And if you, if you look at the, in, among current smokers, it's more than 80% they said it's useful. If you look at a qu specific question, are pictorial health warnings are effective to discourage the youth to start smoking? That is actually one of the, our key objective to prevent the new initiation. So if you look at the, the, the results, both between, in both countries, we apply the same methodology in both countries. If you look at this, in, even in Indonesia, it's a pictorial health one is the size is 40%, but it's a newly introduced. That's why if you look at among the youth between 13 and 17, the 50 percent of they said yeah, they are very effective. They would help. Pictorial health warning would help to prevent start smoking. In Nepal, it's about uh, the, the uh, 46 percent as well. So the, uh, the another objective of pictorial health warning is to build the public awareness to sustain the uh, uh, the ex smoker to remain as a quitter. So the the uh, the ex smoker from both countries, Nepal and Indonesia. They highly supported this, and they believe that this pictorial health warning would help them to sustain the, uh, the uh, non-smoking behavior. And this is also very interesting. The, I, I think the another one is the pictorial health warning is, did pictorial health warnings make the smoker think to quit smoking? If you look at this, yes, one of the objectives of the pictorial health warning is to help the smoker to encourage them to quit. In Indonesia, 47% of the smokers, they said, yes, because of the pictorial health warning, they have thought to quit smoking. In Nepal, it's about 60% of the smokers, they said, yes, it would definitely help to quit smoking. If you look at the further, we have, they also asked this question, did pictorial health warning make the smoker to reduce number of cigarette smoke per day? If you look at in the Nepal, compared to the text warning, uh, sorry, the uh, Indonesia, and after pictorial health warning, in that when there was a text warning, the smoker used to smoke 15 cigarettes on average per day. And after the, the implementation of a 40% pictorial health warning, and this said, yes, they reduce, it's not very significant, but it's uh, from 15 to 11, the overall 27% on average, they reduce the number of cigarette smoke per day. But in the other hand, in Nepal, on average, the smoker used to smoke 11 cigarettes per day. And after the introduction of a 75% pictorial health warning, they reduced to five on average. I think that's a big, the, these are, as I mentioned earlier, it's a not very scientific study. You all are science, scientists here, but it's a very preliminary, we ask the people, and then they, 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 they told the story. I think that is the reality. We don't need to uh, test, T-test, chi-square test, oh, ANOVA, blah, 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 blah. But simple information is pictorial health warning works. I think that's a, enough for us for, as, a, as a tobacco control advocates. And we have to go really, we don't need the five years, the, the studies. These are the information that we can bring to the policy maker, change the policy. Because of this, Nepal, the health minister convinced that time to increase the size further. So that's a 90% pictorial health warning. And the same year, 75% pictorial health warning was implemented. We did this study immediately after six months, government increased the size. We asked the further question, because as we know, the when pictorial health warning got implemented, 
the smoker tend to shift their behavior to buy the cigarette. So did, Victor, did you buy a pack of cigarette or lose stick during your last purchase? If you look at more than almost 80% of the, the, the smoker, they shifted from the pack to the lose cigarette. See, it's effective. Because that, that we expected, right? And we see the, the, the also on the ground is happening like this. So it tells a great story. And then pictorial health warning leads to the policymaker to think to ban the loose cigarette. And early this year, government of Nepal announced a regulation to ban loose sticks. Reasons. We ask further question. Why? Why did you buy the loose cigarette? If you look at this, about two thirds of the smoker decided, yes, they don't want to see the, the yes, I understand. They don't want to see the picture on the pack. See, so we see the, the, uh, the, the advantage from different perspective of the pictorial health warning. In Myanmar, recently, the, the, uh, this is the, the, the public opinion poll that Ministry of Health did in 2014. Look at, you can see the, 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 the effectiveness of the pictorial health warning compared to the text warning. So this is really remarkable. This one slides, we, we only presented this slide to the health minister and he got convinced on the spot immediately. And he decided to go for larger pictorial health warning. Not pictorial health warning, larger pictorial health warning. Because we don't want to repeat the story of India. So, the another thing is, that's about the public. So what happened to the, the industry side? Yes, they are very active. They, 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 in Nepal, you can see the, like, uh, Dr. Fuad already presented. They went to the court, they mobilized the different groups, they mobilized the uh, US Chamber of Commerce, they threatened. So it means pictorial all health warning also working for them as well. So it's not only for the people, it's also for the, uh, the industry as well. And they, they, are, they are putting their, all the resources, trying their best, but they are not effective. We are effective, we manage to secure the 90% pictorial health warning. That's the message. In, uh, in Cambodia, Interesting, you, you can see the tobacco industry, the association, tobacco grower, Ministry of Finance, all, they, they try to mobilize. But finally what happened with the strong leadership of Ministry of Health and also the, the support from the media and also the, the civil society, they managed to implement 50%, 55% pictorial health warning. In Myanmar, interesting story, British American tobacco, BAT, used the Swiss embassy, can you imagine? to block the 75% uh, pictorial health warning in Nepal, oh, sorry, in Myanmar. They, they use the Myanmar Investment Commission. So all, they tried their best, but what happened? 75% pictorial health warning got implemented anyway from the September this year. So in conclusion, I would like to say, yes, they are effective. I don't know whether I, I tried, whether you got convinced or not, but I'm sure the tobacco industry will be convinced uh, the, they know that this, these are the effective intervention, and it's a time. I would like to say you, we should think differently. We should not do the business as usual. If you are going to implement or uh, increase the size, don't go 50% 60 Go for the 90% the, uh, the and more. We have to go bring the best package to our people. You, we hardly get the opportunity to the minister. If you, are, if you meet the minister, please go for 90% or beyond and time to think differently, and we have to change the world. And we have to change the world. Nobody will change. So we have the time, let's do the best, and prevent the tobacco industry, stop them, and go for the better pic pictorial health warning. In Thank the you, Tara, that's Thanks. great. Now the next speaker is called Turk. Tahir Turk. And he's not Turkish, <laughs> and I'm pleased as a Turk to be uh, announcing his name. Okay, so this, uh, this presentation fits in very nicely with Tara's presentation because it's really about the efficacy of graphic health warnings and how we can actually build the salience of uh, health warnings using health communication. So we know there's evidence from high-income countries, Australia and other countries, that shows that when you use communication campaigns 
to support graphic health warnings implementation that you can actually increase the salience of the graphic health warnings. And there has been some questions from some of my colleagues in a few countries saying, we implemented graphic health warnings, but we didn't really get the traction that we wanted. And so we're going to just explore how you may be able to get more traction using these campaigns. So there are indications that uh, pictorial warnings which depict very graphic imagery, disease body parts, evoke disgust, may be the most effective in supporting behavioural changes. And you'll note all of the pre-testing studies for the graphic health warnings identify that it's the most graphic health warnings that the smokers actually prefer and the tobacco users prefer on those packs. Uh, we also know that hard-hitting mass media campaigns using messages synergised with graphic health warnings may provide the optimal behavioural outcomes. So this is what we're going to be testing. The case study was done in Bangladesh earlier this year. New uh, pictorial warnings, as one of our colleagues from India mentioned, were introduced in March of this year, 50% of the, uh, the pack, the top part of the pack. And uh, in fact, I think there were nine warnings uh, rather than the seven. Vital Strategies supported the government of Bangladesh to develop the campaign messages. And we uh, synergised four of the pack warning messages uh, with uh, testimonials on secondhand smoke, lung cancer, throat cancer and oral cancer. So uh, the first part of that process was really to identify patients in, uh, in the local community that had similar conditions to what was depicted on those packs. And so we worked with clinicians in Dhaka to identify uh, patients with uh, severe uh, health conditions uh, that related to the uh, specific pack warnings. It wasn't actually that difficult. There were quite a few patients. Uh, we spent a lot of time getting ethical clearance and working with the patients uh, in order to make sure that uh, you know, everything was done in a, a very ethical and appropriate manner. We developed a range of peripheral materials, so as well as public service announcements for TV. We developed billboards, we developed uh, posters, uh, and we developed a social media website. Uh, part of this process involved post-production pretests. So sometimes we do concept testing, this was actually producing the final materials and then going back and testing with the target groups to see how efficacious those uh, materials are. And we did this through eight focus group discussions, segmented by gender, socioeconomic status and location. And we used uh, a 10 item rating scale that we've used in other multi-country studies. So 10 questions that we've used uh, that are really good uh, uh, questions that identify you know, behavioural intentions and behaviours. And we added another three items to those scales. We used five-point Likert scales, strongly agree to strongly disagree, to identify from a quantitative perspective uh, how people scored these uh, public service announcements. And then we followed up with qualitative uh, uh, probing to see how people felt about the, uh, the, uh, the announcements. So I just wanted to show you some of the pretest stimuli. So these are the posters that were produced uh, from the TV spots. And you can see asthma and throat cancer on the left-hand side. These uh, uh, materials actually appeared as TV spots, uh, community uh, posters, uh, outdoor billboards, and on the social media website, whereas the lung cancer and the oral cancer messages appeared on posters, outdoor materials and social media materials. So obviously the two on the left had much more exposure than the two on the right. In terms of the pre-testing, you'll see uh, this is split by urban and rural groups and you'll see the high scores for the indicators, easy to understand, taught me something new, makes me stop and think, is believable, makes me feel uncomfortable, is relevant to my life, makes me feel concerned about my tobacco use, identifies uh, the highest scores, the two highest scores in red and the two lowest scores in black bold. Um, and you'll see there's a cluster of high scores around what I consider the more graphic ads, oral cancer and throat cancer. They were quite graphic public service announcements and you notice the posters were also quite graphic showing the, uh, the tracheostomy tube and the gr very graphic oral cancer. So uh, those uh, already identified with, with the mean scores that it was the more graphic spots that actually resonated more across the range of indicators. And we found also that the scores for attitudes towards the tobacco industry were much lower. So in the early years of programming, what you find is that attitudes against the industry are actually quite reasonable, and that's why we got lower scores. So that's something we want to build on in the future. So the, the six-week campaign was launched by the Health Minister uh, you know, soon after the implementation of the PAC warnings. 
And uh, Vital Strategies, as I said, produced all these other peripheral materials. And we ran an intensive six-week burst of uh, television media, uh, you know, supporting the posters and the billboards. The uh, website was promoted on all of the uh, collateral materials, so the uh, posters and the uh, print materials and the, uh, the billboards and the TV spot had the social media website, which was called www.packpeople.bd. So the outcome evaluation following the survey used a cross-sectional survey of 1,800 tobacco users, smokeless and smokers, as well as dual users, aged 16 to 55, so that was our target population. We used a, a uh, population proportionate to size methodology where we used the census data to develop our sampling uh, frame and we developed a sampling frame with 600 res respondents from urban and 1,200 from rural with, uh, from around 400 primary sampling units across the country. Uh, I'll just quickly show you only one of the spots that appeared on TV. This is the asthma spot. Doctor Bullin. Cigarette door karone amar bachcha shash koshte. Ekhon khubey khara pabostha. Oke to bachcha noi kochi. Eto khoti hoy jeno manush bachcha dera shabe shabe kano dhumpan kore. Nije dhumpan na kore u unne dhumpan e dhuar karone shash prashashesh shomoshya hote pare. Ita ekhon tamak pondir packeti. Apni jokhon e gulo dekben bishash korben. So I'll just uh, take you through some of the key findings. So this relates to the key performance indicators for the campaign, which relates to knowledge, attitudes, intentions, beliefs and uh, behaviours. So when we look at the campaign recall, you know, we use this as a very important indicator because if people can't even recall the intervention, then their chances of making any behavioural changes are, ex are extremely slim. So what we find without prompting, that 50% or so of the population of the target group uh, uh, without prompting identified, correctly identified the, uh, the messages. Uh, following prompting, using prompt cards with visuals from the TV spots, that rose to 65.8% and 33.4% of that group were not aware. So we're measuring differences between the campaign aware group and the campaign unaware group, okay? So when we look at recall by message source, we'll see the bulk of people recall the messages from television, although we got a fantastic result from community posters. And I think the reason for that was we had a very good dissemination program of community posters that were frame, uh, mounted and put up in all of the community health centres around the country. So, you know, that I think is probably the highest recall result we've got for a community media that I can remember. Uh, other recall uh, sources were family members and the billboards around 17, 18% and then uh, from 0.3% to 3.1% of other sources of, uh, of information on the, uh, on the campaign. In terms of the key messages recalled, so the, the specific messages they recalled, you'll note uh, mother and asthmatic child was recalled by 25% and throat cancer was recalled by 56%. This is really interesting uh, when you look at these findings because when we looked at the actual uh, GRPs, which is the uh, gross rating points for these spots, and we looked at the reach and frequency of these spots, what we found is that mother and child actually got over 200 GRPs in the monitoring report, whereas the throat cancer victim only achieved 80 GRPs because a lot of the TV stations didn't want to run it. So here's one spot that achieved, you know, less than, around one third of the reach and frequency of the other spot, yet achieved twice the recall. So that straight away tells you something about the types of spots that work in resource limited settings. The other two spots, lung cancer victim and oral cancer victim, still had pretty good recall despite the fact they didn't appear on TV. So we'll just do the st statistical measures for some of the key findings, chi-square chi tests and t-tests, and we're looking at confidence intervals of 95%, 99%, and 99.9% confidence with three asterisks for highly significant findings. So when we look at the impact of campaign awareness on knowledge of health risks, what we find when we compare the campaign unaware group with the campaign aware group is highly significant findings across all of those indicators. In fact, there were three or four additional indicators of knowledge and all of them were highly significant in terms of the campaign aware group. Uh, serious illness, uh, knowledge about lung cancer, lung disease, oral cancers, asthma attacks, heart disease, etc., etc. When we looked at the impact of campaign awareness on attitudes and intentions, we also found highly significant findings in favour of the campaign aware group. So these are t-tests, mean scores, 
and uh, the, some of the attitudes make tobacco users see the harms of their use, show the harms of smoking on innocent others, uh, encourage tobacco users to quit tobacco, makes me feel more confident to try and quit, makes me want to make a quit attempt in the future. Uh, this one's a really important slide for us because what we're looking at is what kind of traction does this campaign have on actual uh, awareness of the graphic health warnings or pictorial warnings on the packs. So we, here we looked at people who recalled the warnings on the packs and also had campaign recall. And what we found is those people that were aware of the pack warnings also uh, and also aware of the campaign had significantly higher attitudes, intentions, self-efficacy perceptions around tobacco, which is really pleasing. And in the last indicators, what we looked at was uh, cessation attempts during the past two months, have you tried to stop smoking? What we found was a pleasing increase of around 12%, which was significant. Uh, and when we looked at smokeless tobacco users during the past two months, we found a three or 4% increase, uh, still significant to 95% confidence probably because of the fact that the two spots that we ran were both related to smoking. One was secondhand smoke, the other one was on smoking biddies and cigarettes. We got a lesser impact with the, uh, the smokeless tobacco users, but again, significant findings and really, if you think about this in terms of a population in uh, Bangladesh of 160 million people, prevalence of 43%, uh, break that down to the numbers, the cost per cessation attempt is probably, you know, in, in, the, in the sense and if we looked at it in terms of econometric uh, analysis, uh, this campaign, I think, was less than $200,000 for the media buy. So very, very highly cost effective. Here's the wrap up. Hard hitting mass media campaigns synergized with graphic health warnings do provide optimal behavioral outcomes. Uh, graphic messages in line with the graphic health warnings on PACs are much better to use for the TV campaigns than less graphic messages. And personalised messages, this is in line with an article we published in Tobacco Control that show local tobacco victims, a raw and real approach, have much greater cultural resonance and reduce dissonance in smokers. Thank you. Thank you very much for this interesting results. And we're delighted to invite our last speaker, who's Mr Rakesh Gupta from Punjab. And we'll have questions uh, following Mr. Gupta's presentation um, on all of the presentations. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Oh, uh, yeah. So, uh, we, did, uh, we did this study in the uh, state of Punjab in India, and the findings are almost consistent with the, with the earlier speakers, uh, like Tara Singh, uh, he, uh, what he conveyed, uh, the, the findings are almost similar. Uh, this was actually done before the 85% uh, health warnings that came into place in India. And uh, because we had to convince bureaucrats and the uh, courts regarding uh, effectivity of the, uh, high, uh, the larger pictorial health warnings, so this was conducted. Uh, it has been established that uh, uh, it is important to have pictorial health warning uh, about the health hazards of uh, smoking, prevent smokers from initiating smoke, and encourage smokers to quit. And, uh, According to U.S. Surgeon General report, health warnings on cigarette pack packages are a direct and a very cost-effective uh, means of communicating information on health risks of smoking to the consumers. And many countries globally have introduced pictorial health warnings, as told by earlier speakers. Uh, and the objective was to estimate the impact of uh, pack warnings on cigarettes on the behavior of uh, current smokers. It was a cross-sectional studies, and three districts, which were representative of the uh, whole of Punjab, were taken. And the period was December 15 to March 16. So the newer health warnings, they came in April 16. So a three-stage sampling for collecting data from the three randomly selected districts, five, 10 individuals, 15 years and above, divided equally into urban and rural areas with proportional sampling on basis of age group and gender. Tobacco questions, uh, the, uh, 
uh, used in GATT survey in 2009-10, they were uh, used. And the results was 97% uh, of the people who smoked, they, they sought pictorial health warnings. And earlier, they were only 40%. So these findings of 40% pictorial health warnings. And among the 97%, 61% thought about quitting after seeing the warnings uh, labels. So that was quite significant. The effect of pictorial health warning was universal, 100% in 18 to 24 years age group. Everybody in this age group who watched the health warning on cigarette pack have uh, actually thought of quitting. And the impact of warning was almost equal in urban and rural area, and also across different education status, which demystifies the fact that literacy level and locality have significant effect on the thought process. And the conclusion was that uh, health warnings on cigarette packs are highly effective in thinking about quitting. Further, the effect is more pronounced in the youth who may have just initiated smoking habit. That it was an important finding. Government of India, actually, they have already considered increasing the, uh, they have already increased the Victoria health warnings. And these are the current health warnings. So it is on uh, uh, smoking as well as smokeless products and on the beads as well. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gupta. And can I invite any questions to any of our speakers who haven't diverted to another room for another presentation? It's very interesting. There were a couple of uh, differences of opinion in terms of uh, how far we should push with pictorial warnings, with uh, Fouad mentioning that we should err on the side of caution and go for smaller warnings rather than larger warnings, and someone else saying, you know, go for the bigger warnings, uh, go, as much, go for as much as you can get. And I remember when we in, were engaged in doing these warnings, it was always our view that when you're dealing with governments and the industry, that you always ask for much more than you're going to get because we just knew that whatever we asked for was going to be knocked back. So I was just wondering what your view is on that, whether you should be going for less uh, or whether you would have still been knocked back by the industry. I was actually, uh, the, the point I, I was trying to make was that it is mandatory that you do the political uh, economic mapping and the mapping of the extent to which the tobacco industry has influence in your particular country. Uh, well, my statement wasn't that uh, it should be, it wasn't a broad statement that it should happen in every country. In the context of Pakistan, I was saying that when they went for 85% warning, uh, we knew beforehand uh, that this will not work. <coughs> and uh, we also knew that, uh, you know, you're absolutely right. The, 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 the premise is that you ask for 85% and then you know, negotiate and sometimes settle for around 75%. So. But we also knew that our current government is, is very uh, much influenced by uh, revenue uh, talk because the finance minister is actually the most uh, powerful minister in, in, in the government. He is also um, uh, the father-in-law of the daughter of the prime minister. So it's all a family affair. And they're only concerned with revenues. And we knew that uh, even if the Minister of Health took a stand, she will be shot down, which she was, uh, even after getting uh, the award for, for this and the stating on the floor of the parliament that they would not backtrack on 85% warnings. But we knew that it would not be possible. So my statement actually meant that uh, given the context of your country, you should uh, you know, act according to that. You shouldn't just say that all the other countries in the region have gone to 85% or 80% will, you know, go beyond India and say well, India is 80 percent, we'll go 85 percent. Well, India, the courts took a stand, the civil society took a stand, the minister took a stand. He was, I think, fired or removed, but he took a stand. Our minister didn't give up her position. Uh, I mean, like she made a lot of tall claims in the assembly, but she didn't, when the time came, she didn't give up, the, give up, didn't give up her position. So we knew that 85 percent in Pakistan was impossible. Tara, when for 90%, the Minister of Health was very supportive. The media was very supportive. In Pakistan, the country, uh, the, the context wasn't conducive to 85%. So that's why we felt that if they had gone for a smaller version, there would have been resistance, definitely for sure. 
but we would have still had a better, much better warning, an acceptable warning of 65, 70%, and the benefits would have reached the population. That was my only Thank question. you, Fuad. And Dr. Rana, you had a question. So this is uh, regarding uh, Tahir's presentation. Uh, you mentioned about the recall value of uh, uh, pack warnings in Bangladesh. So three of them had a recall value around 30%, except uh, cancer. So uh, uh, what percentage of uh, recall value is considered as good uh, to that uh, these pack warning will work? Yeah. Yeah. They are not here to discuss. Yes, uh, it's an interesting point in the sense that we don't usually measure the, the individual uh, recall of each one of the messages. In this particular study, what we did is we looked at the recall of individual messages, and we actually, which I didn't report on, we also looked at the impact of recall of India film rule messages because 65% of Bangladeshis watch Indian TV channels. So we wanted to see whether India film rule messages came in and there was 25% prompted recall of India film rule messages as well, which is a fantastic bit of news for policy in relation to film rule and uh, what's going on in Turkey with the 90 minute rule there. But uh, what it really showed us was of the 68% that recalled the messages, the bulk of the recall occurred from a message that obviously appeared on TV because most people get their messages from TV and that's in most of our campaigns. The more graphic message, even though it had much lower rotation, got much higher recall. So the, the message here for us is that if you're operating in a resource constrained setting, what you need to be doing is go for very hard hitting messages and obviously try and get them on the air because the big challenge for us in Bangladesh, even with our current campaign, which is on lung cancer, is that many of the stations are refusing to run the spots. Strangely enough, even when they show the pack warning on the news, they fog out the warning. Can you believe that? So everyone in the country can walk past a kiosk and see the warning, but when the news stations run on TV, they fog it out. So th this is kind of self-censorship in, 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 in the nth degree. So what we'd be saying is if you've got a campaign where you've got recall of 60%, you're doing pretty well. The golden standard for us is if we can get up to 70% recall with prompting, that's a fantastic result, especially in countries where you've got a huge population base. So if you got that in India, you would be jumping up and down. In Bangladesh, similarly. So we're very happy with 68. And that, you know, it showed there was a breakdown of different messages. And it also said to us that the, the main media was TV, although you can get good results with community-based media as well. OK, thank you, Tahir. Who, who the, is the, the, the TV stations are censoring. The TV stations themselves. Yeah, we've got a lot of work to do there. Can I just ask a question to Renu? Uh, Renu, your presentation um, about the 85% warnings and the tobacco industry interference, could you just tell us how the implementation is happening now and whether there is interference with the implementation? Ah, Dr. Rana. So as a co-author, as a... I can uh, respond to that. You see very quick survey have been done uh, after this implementation in the state of Bihar and our uh, partners also, CTFK has done in three states. So overall, uh, uh, very uh, when the pack warning was implemented, even within two months, for example, they started uh, from the month of June. So in the month of June and July, uh, the, the compliance was almost on 65% on uh, cigarette packets. But thereafter, the latest one, currently all tobacco products manufactured by Indian companies, they have, they have pack warnings. And uh, almost uh, uh, 60 to 70% of uh, BD products, they have pack warnings. That's great. Uh, that, that's good to hear. Uh, would you like to add uh, about uh, Bihar? I think we'll move on just yeah? because of time, Dr. Okay. Rana. Okay, thank you. Uh, we'll move on. I had some specific questions about health warning label development and implementation. We've done a state of the evidence at Hopkins. We looked at what we know and what we don't know. And one of the things we don't know in this field is how to best pair images and text we saw lots of examples. So I'd be curious to hear from the people that spoke or other people in the room how this specific content was picked and what sort of other subject areas might be considered. And also, we heard different sort of um, criteria for 
uh, how many different labels are in circulation at a given time, and how, how frequently they're required to be rotated. If anyone can con comment on that, would be good too. Who who would like to, Tara? Uh, I, I want to comment on that part also, and there's some others. So the first thing is like when we go for the pictorial health one, al always we go for the pre-testing at the country <laughs> level and at the local level. So based on the pre-testing re results, we will select the pictures. So it's a very very straightforward. But how do you You mean? I, I don't know if you test them, but how do you? So there is, a, the, you know, the WHO, there is a one library already. So they were, and then with this, uh, some picture, we cannot choose all, right. but they, we consult with the expert group at the country level, that is the Ministry of Health, the medical associations, and some the tobacco smoker is itself, the non-smokers. So it's like uh, the 10 people, and then we pick the pictures. Not we, the group. Okay. Um, and then those pictures will be the, the, the pre-tested at the, at the country. Thank level. you. Just and then many countries, uh, rotation is, it depends on the six months and nine months and 20. On, on that particular question, yeah. I think we've got yeah. another example so from India. Uh, no, no, I have one more, more thing, let me see. So the, regarding the pictorial health, one, I think that this is uh, something like we, are n we should discuss and agree. We should promote the larger pictorial health warning. Tari, tar we'll I, just I take this one of Hopkins the thing is question like first. Like, for example, no, look, look at even the country big or small doesn't matter. The tobacco industry, they put all their efforts. Even even Nepal, we, they spend everything. They, they use all the avenues because they don't want to see any best practice. So my question, request all of us is we should really go for the larger pictorial health warning and then you can get something. Thank you, Tara. Yeah. Uh, Ashish, do you want to comment on the graphic uh, text? What we did, uh, what happened in India when... Uh, they go for the uh, the new set of uh, pictorial warning. So there was a consultative process with which include the Ministry of Health, uh, the VI partners, and the civil society. They come up with the themes that in which themes we should go, we should consider for the uh, collection of the new set of pictorial warning. And on those themes, then they uh, they uh, as uh, Tara just shared, then the WHO library and other library has been. Uh, surveyed that where we can get those pictures. In fact, at the end of the uh, the process, they actually went to the ground and they uh, actually clicked the picture from the real uh, uh, real setting. Uh, so this is how uh, the whole process has gone. And then, which is, which was shortlisted, they went again back to the film for the field testing, and then finally uh, the report was submitted to the Ministry of Health for selection. So I asked Ty here something um, about this uh, throat cancer thing. We had a similar uh, ad on TV in Turkey, and it was the most effective one, and people started running to cessation clinics all, all of a sudden. It increases awareness like nothing else. However, it was stopped immediately by the government. So it, it seems that uh, that sort of, this throat cancer thing with tracheostomy mm. is a really important one to go on with. It is, but I can tell you generally, uh, in, and this is in line with the pre-testing on tobacco packs as well, because you can see the images that are selected by the smokers in the focus group pre-testing are incredibly graphic. And we know also that the messages that we use for the TV campaigns, the more graphic ones seem to have the best response with tobacco users. So the one that was actually the most powerful out of all of those spots was the oral cancer spot. If I showed you that TV ad, you'd all be running for the door, really. There's an examination of the oral cancer patient with a really graphic oral cancer and it scored through the roof. So it was about six points, eight points above all of the other spots. The coordinating group in Bangladesh actually also said, this is a spot we want to run with. And when we thought about it, we thought even though this spot would definitely get people quitting, we won't be able to get this spot on air. So the current challenges we've got uh, are to get the spot on air and negotiate with the TV station so they run it. I think that wouldn't be so much of a challenge in some countries where you've got PGR. But I do know even in Australia when we had very graphic spots in the early days, we used to have to fog out during general viewing times the graphic areas of the spot. But I wouldn't stop. I would, I would actually still do that and run during parental guidance uh, because the indications with this uh, recent study really show that at one-third of the GRPs, you can still get twice the recall rate. And I can guarantee you 
people would be quitting at higher rates in relation to that ad. When we do the regression analysis, I'm sure we'll probably find that. Can I invite, we've got time for one, uh, one last question. Has anyone got a burning question that they want to ask to one of our experts? Could I ask another one? Uh, what is the best method to measure the efficacy uh, of uh, that picture? Because you have come up with different presentations and in every one of them there was another method asking people whether they were affected by it. Is it a good method to measure? I mean, does that really measure the efficacy? Does any, any particular one of the speakers want to talk about the quantitative and qualitative methods? That yeah, I'll, I'll just tell you, the, you know the 10 country study that we did and we published in BMJ? That was a big study and it was coordinated by Melanie Wakefield, who's probably one of the principal researchers for tobacco mm -hmm. control in the world. The indicators that she developed for that study, she's, she used in about five countries before that. So you couldn't say that they were validated because they weren't scientifically validated. But we've used those indicators now probably for three other multi-country studies and we've used them for at least three or four other qualitative studies. So the, the core ten indicators, uh, this made me stop and think. I could understand this message. I'd talk to other people about this message. This message made me think about quitting. They're very simple statements and on like at scales they give you really good reliable responses. So my recommendation is look at what's been done in the past, look at obviously what's been validated through previous studies and try and standardise a methodology for rating of graphic health warnings for tobacco packs as well as for your pre-testing of, of messages. So you can do comparisons because when we compared those spots with the 10 country study spot, on average they are about 8 to 10 points higher rating because these were personal messages from local people. Okay, thank you, Tahir. And on that note, I'd like to thank all of our speakers and thank you, everyone, for coming along. And an advertorial is, I think there is um, a session coming up shortly on e-cigarettes, if you want a bit of controversy to follow. Yes, thank you. At room 1B.